Hello, I'm Justin Pefferly, an application developer with Codens and an alumnus of 42 Silicon Valley. While Codens is based out of Colorado, I live in Idaho with my wife, 13-year-old daughter, and 1-year-old son. In addition to application development, I perform a lot of IT administrative work, and I wanted to bring some of those skills to Claris Engage this year. Hence my topic, FileMaker Deployment 101.5. Whether you are just starting a project, migrating an existing database, or you have just completed a new solution altogether, there's a deployment in your future. The versatility of FileMaker Server opens the door to multiple deployment options. Will you deploy FileMaker Server on Windows or OS X? Will the server be on-site or hosted in the cloud, and what should the server specifications be? I'm going to be discussing gathering the information that you need to answer deployment questions and bring you closer to go live. When looking at server specifications, there is a lot to be considered, but primarily we want to focus on the hardware shown in the minimum requirements. The processing power, or CPU, the amount of memory, or RAM, the storage capacity of the server, and although it's not shown here, it's important to consider network bandwidth. As you can see, these are just the minimum requirements. We don't see recommended requirements for 10 users or 25 users, and that's because users aren't the only deciding factor for what's required. It's important to understand the demand that the solution will place on the server. One of the simplest ways to gather this information is also one of the most important, the client conversation. This is a template of a document that I use when preparing a deployment to AWS. It's not intended to be a questionnaire that is read line by line, but instead to guide the conversation. Also, since both clients and developers tend to be excited with a new project, it helps me make sure not to forget anything in the excitement. The first section is just information that I use to reference the project, with the exception of special requirements. This is where I would list something such as if the solution will contain medical data that must meet HIPAA requirements. I will gather general FileMaker server information such as the version being deployed and the license to be used for the deployment. If the client hasn't purchased a license, I'll make a note that our team needs to reach out to assist with purchasing the license. I always talk with the clients about their backup needs. If it's a migration, this may be simply mirroring the existing schedule, but it's not unusual for a client to really have no idea what their backup schedule should be. In this situation, it's important to draw a line between the level of acceptable and unacceptable data loss. For some clients, entering a day's worth of data is nearly effortless, while for others, the same could be devastating. Once this threshold is determined, you can recommend a backup schedule. Don't forget offsite backups. In cases where I'm performing deployment and someone else completed the development, I like to have a discussion about how the client expects the application to be used. Just to see if there's anything else I should be considering during deployment. In this case, I made a note about a large amount of container data that's going to require additional storage. I'll take note of any connectors, such as WebDirect or ODBC, so the network can be properly configured. This next section, the AWS section, is specific to an AWS deployment, and it's something that I use to store instance-specific information once an instance has been decided on. Networking. Networking can be a complicated conversation. Often, clients haven't considered the server address or the domain, and in cases where SSL is required, a domain is also required. I will be going over network configuration a bit later on. Once you have had the deployment conversation, the server picture starts coming together, and when paired with additional resources, you can start to get an idea of what the server should look like. 
this is the FileMaker Cloud instance on the AWS Marketplace for 25 users. Looking at this, we can see that it's recommended a t2.large instance be used. If we mouse over the instance type, it'll show us the specifications for that instance. Here, the server has 8 gigabytes of memory, and it has two CPUs. If we go back and look at another AWS instance, it won't be the same size. For example, five users is no longer the t2.large, but instead a t2.medium. This server has four gigabytes of memory and two CPUs. So it has half the memory of what's recommended for a 25 user server. Also, don't forget the Claris community, both online and offline. As you can see here, I searched for server requirements, and the first result is, what is a, the minimum and recommended server requirements for running FileMaker 19 on-site with 25 users? The Claris community is most likely the best resource for people familiar with FileMaker deployments. Now that FileMaker server has been installed and our solution is hosted, we need to allow users to connect to the database. Depending on where users are connecting from, this may take place in one or two steps. The first step is required for both, and it is creating a firewall rule. In Windows, to create the firewall rule, we need to open up the firewall with advanced security. From there, we'll go to the inbound rules, and we're going to create a new rule. We know the ports that FileMaker server requires, so we're going to do ports. They are TCP ports, and we're going to specify the ones that are required. FileMaker server does require both ports 80 and 443, which are the standard HTTP and HTTPS ports. If you are using ODBC or JDBC, port 2399 is required. Port 5003, and we're going to allow connections to the admin console, so port 16000. Once the ports are specified, we need to say that we are allowing connection over those ports. We're going to allow the rule to apply to any networks should always be able to connect to the FileMaker server. We're going to give it a descriptive name so we know which rule it is and a description as well. FileMaker server. ODBC and admin console. Now we'll be able to clearly tell which rule that is. Right here, it's at the top. The Windows firewall does automatically enable the rule, so no further action is required here to allow connections on the local network. However, if users will be connecting from outside the local network, such as over the internet to WebDirect or using FileMaker Pro Advanced from another location, then we need to allow those connections to come in. Almost all routers and ISP provided equipment, as well as any firewalls, will block the connections by default. So I'm going to show what it's like to adjust those settings in a router. Every router is going to have its own interface, so it's not going to look exactly like this. But the way that I found it was uh, I just started searching for port forwarding. If you don't have a search feature, it's usually in the area of internet or internet security. And what we're doing is we're creating a rule that says when somebody tries to connect on a port, we're going to forward it to our server. So once again, we're going to do the 
descriptive name of FileMaker server. This router does require that the rule be enabled. And you can choose where the connection's allowed from. So if only one user needs to connect, and they always connect from the same IP address, you can restrict it to just that IP address to keep it more secure. If you have multiple users connecting, or users are frequently changing locations or IP addresses, then that may not be a good option, and connections will need to be allowed from everywhere. The ports will be the same that were enabled in the Windows firewall. However, in this example, I'm going to exclude the admin console. We're going to say that to access the admin console, you need to be on the local network. The forward IP will be the IP address of the FileMaker server, and only TCP is required. If both was selected, it would work, but there's no need to forward additional ports. So once again, just quickly recap, we're saying that from anywhere, if a request comes in on these ports, we're going to forward it to this address, which is our FileMaker server. Once this rule is applied, then connections will be allowed to come in since Windows Firewall allows connections to the server, you'll be able to connect over the internet. I also want to show what this looks like if you're running a server on AWS because the process is quite different. So if you're running a FileMaker server on AWS, you're using EC2. And in EC2, we want to go down to Network and Security and locate the security groups. Once in Security Groups, you want to choose Create Security Group. And you'll give the security group a name, like My FileMaker Server. And we'll say this is for FileMaker Server and ODBC. Now we need to add rules. And these rules are going to be each of the ports. AWS does have common ports pre-configured, so you can select HTTP and HTTPS. I will need custom ports after that for ODBC. We'll give it a name here. And five thousand three for FileMaker server. For the source, we're going to say that they can connect from anywhere. And outbound rules don't need to be adjusted. By default, a new security group allows all traffic to go out from the server. Once the security group has been created, then we need to tell the FileMaker server to use that group. To do that, from the instances, you would select your FileMaker server, go to Actions, Networking, and choose Change Security Groups. We want to find our newly created security group, which I named My FileMaker Server, and we will add that. If additional security groups are not being used, they should be removed. Click on Save, and the security group has been changed. These changes are effective almost immediately, so you should be able to connect to your FileMaker server right away. Now I want to talk about using domains with FileMaker Server. Our FileMaker Server is running, but instead of connecting to the server using an IP address such as 104.199.124.156, with a domain name, we can connect using something like presentation.codex.com. 
The domain can, contains DNS records, which are like a phone book for the internet. When a client connects using this presentation.codens.com, it asks the DNS server to look up the address, and the DNS server returns the IP address. The client and the server are still communicating using that IP address in the background. Using a domain name doesn't just make the server easier to remember. It allows us to secure our connection using SSL. Domains are purchased from a registrar, such as GoDaddy or Namecheap. In this example, I'm using Google Domains. I've pulled up clarisengagepresentation.com, which is available for purchase. And if I were to purchase this domain, I would be able to manage the DNS records. Those are the DNS records that I need to add so that when clients request to connect using the domain, the correct IP address is returned. When creating DNS records, they can be added to a root domain. So that would be something like codents.com, or they could be added to a subdomain such as presentation.codents.com. However, subdirectories such as codents.com slash presentation cannot be configured with DNS records and instead require a web server. When configuring DNS records, they have four parts. The name is the host or domain. The type is the type of DNS record. We'll be working with A or address records and text records. The TTL is the time to live. And this says how long a DNS record is good for. Records that change frequently usually have a lower TTL and records that do not change frequently have a higher TTL. The data is the actual information that's stored in the DNS record. So in the example I provided, the server is located at 104.199.124.156, but we want to connect using presentation.codens.com. So the configuration of a record for that would look just like this. We have the subdomain. We've created an A or address record that's good for an hour, and it points to the IP address that the server is located at. Another benefit to domain names is that they can be updated. If a company's IP address changed due to relocation and 100 clients were connecting using the IP address, then the information would need to be updated in each client. Since we're using the domain name, all I need to do is change the A record to point to the new IP address. And since there is a TTL of one hour, some clients may have to wait up to an hour for the update, but it's much faster than updating 100 clients. As I mentioned, one of the benefits to domains is that you can use an SSL certificate. SSL, or Secure Sockets Layer, is a protocol that protects the data being exchanged between the server and a client. An SSL connection lets a client confirm the identity of the server and it encrypts the data so it can't be read by anyone between the client and the server. A common example of this is in the browser bar when the lock symbol is shown to the left. That is indicating that the connection is secured by SSL or TLS and that the information is protected. To use SSL, you must have a domain that you control and validate control of the domain with the certificate authority. SSL certificates can be purchased or they can be created using a free service. Both require validation of domain control. There are different types of SSL certificates available that require additional validation, but I'm just going to be talking about domain validated SSL certificates. 
Now, when purchasing SSL certificates, validation can be performed multiple ways. One example is an email can be sent to some predefined addresses such as admin at the domain.com, but I'm going to show how to validate using a text record just for the visual purpose. When you purchase a SSL certificate from a certificate authority and are performing domain validation, the record information is provided through the website or through an email. I've requested the information using a scripted process just so we can see it here. So I requested a staging or test certificate be issued using DNS validation for presentation.codence.com. It's indicated that I need to host a record at this acmechallenge.presentation.codence.com with this value. And what's happening is right now, the certificate authority is occasionally sending a request to that address and they're looking for this text record in the response. So if I want to validate that, I would need to put in the address that they have provided. So that's the acne challenge. And I also need to put a dot presentation here. The root domain is automatically implied. So this will be the acne challenge.presentation.codence.com. I'm creating a text record, which is going to use a value of one hour, and place the value there. Now that it's published, the next time the certificate authority checks that domain for the value, the value will be returned, and since it matches what they provided, they know we have access to the DNS records and have domain control, they will issue the certificate and the certificate will be available for download or emailed. Certificates will come in a format that looks similar to this here. So we have our certificate, our key, and this is an intermediate certificate. So once we have that, we can get it updated in FileMaker server. We would just click import custom certificate from the SSL certificate tab in configuration. The signed certificate file is going to be the one that's for our domain, so it's going to be our domain dot certificate. Private key file is the same except it's going to be dot key. This private key file should not be shared externally. If the domain provider provided a password for the private key, it needs to be entered here. It won't work without it. Not all certificate authorities will provide an intermediate certificate, but if one is provided, it needs to be added. It is often the CA.CRT, so certificate authority.certificate. And what that is, is this intermediate certificate here. So GoDaddy is the root authority. This is our certificate. There can be one or more intermediate certificates in between. If you don't include the intermediate certificate file, the chain would be broken because GoDaddy root did not directly issue this certificate. And if the chain's broken, the browser will report an error or services such as the FileMaker Data API that rely on SSL won't function properly.